and all this, this yeah. talent. But right now, I suppose they're, they're going to Guy Pearce. I left him, him on. Yeah, I mean, Jeffrey Rush. I mean, you wouldn't probably... Well, you could. I mean, the point is, is he, yes. For a small country, we have a lot of international players. And it meant that I, in this moment, could convince a studio to fund a large sweeping epic that was an Australian story that I hope plays to the world. Now, that's a big ask, and I understand it's probably foolishly ambitious, and we, it won't be easy, not an easy road, but we could do it, and we had a go at it. Mm. How much do you think you have to know uh, about Australia or be interested in Australia to, to kind of fall in love with the epic Not Australia? at all, right? Not one bit. You know, Jay, it's a very good question. I know where you're leading this because really it's not about Australia. I mean, no more than Casablanca is about Casablanca. I mean, Casablanca is a, is a metaphor really for a place of refugees, for people hiding, characters traveling somewhere else, coming from somewhere else, trying. It's a border story, really. Australia is a title that for Lady Sarah Ashley, the main character played by Nicole Kidman, who is an English aristocrat in the 30s, Australia is the title of a land far, far away. Now, although I begin with a lot of research and I found the period to set it in, I draw in a pretty classical way from classical storytelling shapes. This storytelling shape is fundamentally one of a character. His name is Lawrence. He's not happy with England. He goes to a faraway land called Arabia, and he has intense relationships, goes on extraordinary journey. There is landscape, lots of music. And through that journey, his character is transformed. Same with Lady Sarah Ashley. She goes to a land far, far away. It's called Australia. And there she has an intense relationship with a rough hue and cattle drover played by Hugh Jackman, who's not really that rough hue and it was acting, right? And they go and have this intense relationship. There's a cattle drive and a bombing and boom, 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 blah, 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 And she is transformed. A bit like that other film where that story shape is alive. What, what film is that, Jason? A lady goes away. She's, by happenstance, finds herself in a land far, far away. Oh, the one with the red shoes and the dog? <laughs> He's totally on top of it. Yes, it's... <laughs> Do we have an apple prize for Jason? <laughs> It's the Wizard of Oz, which is a primary. You're right. It's a primary storytelling shape. And, uh, she finds herself in a land far, far away. Meets the sunny characters, going down the yellow brick road, and discovers that the thing that she's been looking for ultimately was there all along. And that's not really about home as a physical place, but as a as a spiritual place. It is. It is, it is within. So, without getting too too. Um, shamanistic about it all story does move back to primaries why i mean shakespeare did not write romeo and juliet as we all know he john brown poem goes back to a greek myth pyramus and thisbe oh what you mean young people fall in love and the adult world goes we're having a war you can't do that and tragedy will ensue that becomes story shape because it's a truth universal human truth so that's kind of that's why you don't have to like Australia to enjoy the film. Mm, that's what I think. I however, have. however, it, it is, it is a, a wonderful setting for it. I mean, let's just talk about some of the locations. I know you talked about finding David uh, Gorpel and, and Brandon in, in the bush. There ha you have got these amazing, amazing vistas, uh, waterfalls, deserts, yeah. cliffs. Uh, where did you shoot it uh, in Australia? And, um, and was it, you're the one, it's one Australian film that there are no flies in this film. I know that. It, quite no flies on us. There yeah. are, exactly. Well, actually, it's the truth. That particular part of the outback, there are parts of the outback, I don't know if you've ever seen that Missy Elliott clip, you know, when she got face covered in flies? You should see it. But it, <laughs> there are parts of the outback where it's pretty much like that. In fact, we went on a drove, did we not? We had to wear funny sort of uh, fly protection equipment. But up in the northwest, where they have the wet, there were no flies at all. So no flies in the film except the one that the bad guy kills. And no animals were hurt in the making of this film. It's a CG fly. Rather brilliantly done, I have to say. I think it's probably one of our best pieces. I think what you're talking about is, yes, it's true. We did a lot of foolish things. Probably the most foolish was to attempt to shoot it old school. See, something like Gone with the Wind, to have broad comedy and have action and romance and drama all in the same film, 
you have to have a visual language. You have to let the audience be comfortable about the height of playing that requires. I mean, slapstick gags next to God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again. I mean, when, when that is playing, it's not reality behind her. God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again. That's, you know, Scarlett O'Hara, in case you didn't pick up on my clear characterization. But it's a painted mat, you know? The world is heightened. So we had a philosophy, rightly or wrongly, that we would go out and shoot David Lean style on location, 200 crew members through deserts and storms and difficult things. And then mix that with a sort of use of CG, the George Lucas of it all, in a sort of painterly way. Not in so much a reality way, but a sort of painterly heightened visual language. And we mix the two things together, I hope, so that you could have African queen-like gags next to very intense dramatic moments. So that was the philosophy of the shoot. And, you know, for whatever it's worth, and I'm sure it sounds like a director spinning it, but I went out there sort of saying I wanted to be transformed by the experience, really going like, hey, I'm so busy, I could be in the Sistine Chapel and not notice, really. Where are we today? You know, it's just intense, the experience. But the truth is I was transformed by the landscape out there. I had a weird experience where um, I sort of felt like I was losing the movie early on. It was too big. And um, actually, I said, look, we were shooting uh, near the homestead. And I said, I'm going to stay out here tonight. Just leave the van out. And, you know, the stunt guys were putting up chicken wire fences. There was a lot of crocodiles at the bottom of the thing. I thought I'd get, the boss will get eaten, you know. I didn't really think it would work. I thought it'd stay a night. I never left for six weeks. You know, we built a fire and you sort of realize out there because the landscape is so vast and so powerful that before that point, I felt small and the, and the movie was too big. But each night I was reminded that the movie is very small and the universe is everywhere. And it really centered me up. So without spinning it too much... It was an incredible spiritual journey. Hmm. I think that comes, across, comes across in the film as well, because we say it's, it's funny, it's kind of epic, but it does have a, a, a spirituality to it, it, it that's mixed up in there that really comes across. Thank you, James. Thank you. Uh, I, just before we, we, we talk about the stars, because everyone wants to know... Nicole, what is Nicole, Nicole really like? What's she like? What's she like? She's really excited. <laughs> um, oh, well. oh, no, actually, let's talk about Nicole. She's a handful. Yeah. Uh, is it, what, you, cast, you cast Nicole. I mean, was she the first name that you had in there? Uh, look, I'd go back a long way with Miss Kidman. Please come out of the van. Um, and, you know, that's an interesting and unique, fairly unique. Fair, not unique, but there comes an advantage you don't think about. We do, we are still very professional. She pushes me, I push her. But we have experienced a lot in, I mean, it's over more than 10 years. I don't know when I... I actually did a magazine with her years ago. We were editing Vogue, Celebration of Australia, and she was in that. So I've known her a long time. This is before Moulin Rouge. Yeah, before Moulin Rouge. Then we did that um, little commercial piece. And then, but I guess when I came to doing this, she, of course, was my first instinct. But I always challenge my instincts because I figure that probably I'm the best person to argue with myself. So I try and convince myself it's a wrong idea. But then you ask the question, well, okay, who do I need? I need someone who's a fabulous technical actor. I've got to be a drop-dead old-style movie star. They've got to be incredibly brave and do ridiculous things and always put their career on the line. Uh, I'm going to ask them to do slapstick comedy like Lucille Ball next to sort of psychological drama. Uh, and you've got to be able to get financing for the film. So it's a pretty short list, to be honest. And I did the full circle, came back to Nicole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you need them to be... Because actually she plays an English woman. So yes. Did you, was it important that she was Australian? No, she could have, it could have been an English player, easily. Uh, it just turned out that when I went around... And of course, something interesting, I've done a lot of films and at the centre of them are partnerships, relationships. And you can't cast one really without the other. It's in a chemical equation and you can't dial that up. I spent a lot of times making those identifications. Moulin Rouge, the same thing. What's interesting about this is I started out with Russell Crowe. He's an Australian actor. And he, I mean, Russell's probably one of the great actors of all time, in my view. 
but you know he's very busy and 